Russia. And our country is dominated by evil men. These men, take is illegal to call yourself a feminist and to sing punk music. These men think it's illegal to stand up for the rights of the gay and lesbian community. These men, think that you can't criticize your government. These men think that if you sing and dance in an inappropriate way, you get two years in prison. who will set the stage for um, what we're going to hear from the panel. The first is Professor Smith Narula, professor of law here at NYU and um, a faculty director of the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice. Smitha. Thank you very much, Amy. Thank you all for being here today. It's wonderful to see such a turnout. I've been tasked with the impossible task of providing a succinct introduction to the issues. So it is a complicated subject with many fields being addressed and touched, as Amy noted. But my goal here is simply to provide an overview of the case and some of the dimensions of the debate and human rights issues of concern. The colorfully masked feminist punk rock protest band Pussy Riot has generated a great deal of attention since five of its members performed a punk prayer in Moscow's Cathedral of Christ the Savior on February 21st of this year. In early March, three members of that band, Maria Alyokhina, Nadezhda Tolokonyukova, and Yekaterina Samutsevich, were arrested as a result of that performance. As pretrial detention stretched to mid-June without a trial date set, international attention also grew. Amnesty International dubbed the women prisoners of conscience and a YouTube video that I'm sure many of you have seen of the cathedral performance entitled Mother of God Chase Putin Away has reached viral status. I checked this morning and as of this morning more than 2.2 million viewers have seen that video. 
When the trial finally began, it drew media comparisons to Soviet-era show trials, marred by the exclusion of defense witnesses and journalists alike. After five months of pretrial detention, on August 17th, the three women were found guilty of premeditated hooliganism performed by an organized group of people motivated by religious hatred and hostility. They were sentenced to two years of corrective labor in a general penal colony. Pussy Riot accused President Putin and the Russian Orthodox Church of orchestrating the case. In fact, the close co connections between Putin and the church are in fact what inspired their original protest. And the international press reacted forcefully to what they widely perceived to be an attack on freedom of expression. Western governments too have entered into the mix and they've expressed concern with the results of the trial and the treatment of the detainees. And human rights organizations were quick to decry the punishment as inappropriate and disproportionate, calling the trial a travesty and a sham. Even Prime Minister Medvedev has publicly stated that the ban had already served enough jail time and that imprisoning them further would be quote unquote unproductive. Human rights concerns about due process and about freedom of expression, which abound in cases throughout Russia, have put Pussy Riot at the center of renewed national protests in the country around Russia's political system. These same issues are also at the crux of an international movement that has emerged in support of the ban and its viral message but opinion within Russia remains divided, with many reportedly favoring the band members' arrest and imprisonment. Moreover, the same governments that are now condemning the work of the Pussy Riot Court and agitating for the band members' release have instituted their own form of repression against protest at home. In our own backyard, Occupy Wall Street protesters have been subject to arbitrary arrest and detention, as well as police violence, as was documented in the July report, Suppressing Protest, co-authored by the Global Justice Clinic here at NYU Law School. Masked Pussy Riot supporters in New York City have also been arrested under a penal code provision that criminalizes as loitering being masked in a group in a public space. Good to know. Issues of protest, public performance, and a fair trial and punishment are indeed ripe for discussion in Russia, in the United States, and around the world. It's a privilege to have here with us today Nadezhda Tolokonikova's husband, Pyotr Verzilov, who will be joining us shortly, and Pussy Riot's defense team. We look forward to hearing your views on the case, the controversy, and the future of protest in Putin's Russia and beyond. Thank you all for joining this conversation today. Next, we're going to hear from, I have to say it, the great, the amazing artist, Karen Finley, um, who made this event happen. You really did make this happen. And um, Karen's art has inspired countless others, and she um, has a lot to teach us about struggle for freedom of artistic expression. Karen. I want to thank my colleagues and the NYU community for working together for making this happen. And uh, I want to also welcome everyone from Russia here to NYU. Thank you for coming here today. I am going to respond today as an artist. Um, I am a professor here at, in the Department of Art and Public Policy, so I am just going to respond with a poem. We are pussy riot now. The Virgin Mary is pussy riot. Her annunciation, her hot pussy bore the son of goddess. Eve, the first woman, is so pussy riot, taking that first bite of apple, leaving the Garden of Eden to a snake. Cleopatra is pussy riot in her pussing boots, down the Nile to meet Anthony, claiming the throne as her own. Joan of Arc is hearing voices, fighting for dear France and the good old c'est la vie. Sounds like pussy to me. <laughs> Elizabeth I, the virgin queen, purring my hot pussy. Riot, riot, riot. Pussy, pussy, pussy. Mary Magdalene, oh don't forget her. Her body is hers and ours. Pussy riot, touch me. Frida Kahlo, her audacious creativity without the use of tweezers. God bless. 
Gertrude Stein, a pussy is a pussy is a riot. Is a pussy a pussy riot puss. Josephine Baker is pussy riot, a la banana dance in Paris. How dare she? Virginia Woolf is writing it all down, telling it like it is or isn't. Sometimes pussy riot is like that. Anna Mae Wong is surely pussy riot, going against type for the full screen. Sojourner Truth is pussy riot, the Underground Railroad, an abolitionist, moving us forward, setting the course. Georgia O'Keeffe painted pussy like no other. <laughs> Our petals and undulations, our spirit we possess, our very pussy nature. Oh, take me, pussy. Oh, make me, pussy. I am Pussy Riot. We are all Pussy Riot now. Free Pussy Riot. I don't know how you're going to follow this, but um, Danny Aron, who is from the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice, will begin the panel discussion today with the first question. Danny. Uh, I'll make less copious, less copious use of the word pussy. <laughs> uh, the first question, um, as Amy has said, I'm from the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice. So the first question is from a legal perspective. Uh, we're wondering, uh, we understand that you have an appeal to be heard on October the 1st. Uh, and we're at, wondering if you could please take us through the legal arguments uh, that you'll be putting forward at the hearing. And let us know what role, if any, international law and international human rights will play in your response and in the response of the government. And finally, uh, how you see the role of political pressure on the outcome of appeal versus the role of law. Thank you. So, Mark Fagan, I'm one of the lawyers for Pussy Riot, will answer. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we really, on October 1st, are taking part in a, in a, constitu in a, in a constitutional re-examination of the case. This is very important to note. This is not an appeal because Russian legislation doesn't know what, doesn't have, a, doesn't have appeals on this, for, for this category on this stage of a crime. Appeals. Okay, so the, the moment of cassation comes in only with the Okay, this is um, the um, cassation point is just uh, examining the constitutionality of a. Um, Decision. This is only a one-day re-examination. There will be no witnesses. There will not be any studying of the written evidence. There won't be any new evidence or anything like that. This is just in the framework of a constitutional complaint about um, the, the arguments of the sides of here. This is, in many ways, a holdover of Soviet law because the second uh, level of the, the, the constitutional uh, level um, of, for this sort of case is really the last, the last place you can um, re-examine a, a uh, decision. There are other um, oversight um, bodies, but they really are not um, important for the re-examination of the case. The thing is that this case is a political case. It does not have 
really any, um, any juridical foundation because our defendants are, are absolutely innocent. They, they um, committed an administrative offense. This is a, a little fine and that's it. There is an article in the Administrative Codex that says $30 and a fine for this. But, but, but in the soft authoritarian system of Putin as it is now, such political uh, offenses are evaluated not according to the letter of the law, but from, political, uh, from a political standpoint only. Therefore, in this case, we as lawyers don't um, separate ourselves from our defendants. Of course, the most important, the most important condition of, of an attorney's work is, in fact, to do that. But political, but political um, legal advocacy in Russia is possible only if the attorney and the um, the attorney and their um, defendants and the people um, who represent them um, completely identify their common interests of the lawyers and the defendants. We, as lawyers, are part of a po political protest in Russia. And therefore, only, only such attorneys can, um, could be chosen by our uh, defendants. This is not just a, a question of law. This is a question of a political struggle. The attorney who, an attorney whom they trust will never betray them, won't make a deal with the authorities, and for them this is the, the, the most important argument in, um, in favor of choosing us as their attorneys. We understand that this sounds a bit unnatural for the those people, young young um, jurists here, but please, um, but please make allowances for the fact that you're dealing with an authoritarian system. And um, beyond the impossible, um, th this is the only way. This is the only way that we can um, insist on civil rights. The, um, a, a, a straightforward conflict with the system. The only way to defend our, uh, the people we're defending is to ha go into an open confrontation, open political con confrontation. The point of this, this political confrontation is law. Look at the current system in Russia, the current legal system in Russia, is very distantly, is, um, is, a, is a somewhat distantly like the national socialist system, or like, like um, a, corporative, a corporate state in Italy, where law is limited by pol political will of the ruling, of the leading class. And the law can um, be ignored in the interests of this class. If it, is, in, if it is needed for Putin's system, then the law simply ceases to uh, function. In, in the case of Pussy Riot, as in other political cases, the law doesn't play any um, real role. And I would also like to emphasize that the participants of Pussy Riot are not just a punk, a feminist punk uh, group. They are political oppositionists. This is very symptomatic. <laughs> And their, um, and, and their performance has to be um, understood as a, as a uh, challenge to the political system. This, the second thing that they're interested in is they're interested in um, the, the, um, the, the, the deals between the um, system and the church. That's what they're also interested in. But first of all, um, this is a political challenge, a political protest, and outrage about an outrage over the lawless election that took place in Russia. I've said that maybe my, my colleagues would like to answer. I think that was enough. <laughs>
А вы, вы хотите добавить что-нибудь? Да, конечно. Okay, I would also like to say something. Uh, Во-первых, first of all, besides the Pussy Riot case, in Russia there are several political cases. And one of them is the case of, of um, March 6th, May 6th, when um, right before the, the, on the eve of, of Putin's inauguration of the so-called president, the citizens went out to, um, for a peaceful demonstration and the authorities set the police on the people in order to, to bring in the mechanism for freezing um, civil liberties. Besides, besides the fact that in this case um, about um, 15 people have already been arrested, in this case as witnesses almost all the leaders of the, of the um, opposition in Russia are uh, involved. The nature of the cr of criminal trials in Russia is such that the decision is being is made um, by the investigator. The, the investigator, once he brings someone to the into the process, even as a witness, um, it just by with one uh, flick of the pen can make him turn him from a witness into an accused. Therefore, all the leaders of the protest are on, on the authorities' hook. At any moment, the leadership um, could, out of um, political considerations, just um, put them in prison. Two of my colleagues, Violeta Volkova and Mark Fagan, also are involved in this case as witnesses. And this is done um, only so that they can be under pressure um, and that, the, that, that their pressure is put um, on them in the connection with the Pussy Riot case. The authorities really don't like it, the position of, of attorneys who don't make deals with them. Essentially, the role of an attorney in such a corrupt uh, system of um, law and order can be reduced to the role of, of someone who brings money from the client either to the investigator or to the courts. And a certain number of attorneys are perfectly happy with the situation. But we are not happy with the situation. We think that the status of an attorney does not allow an, uh, an attorney to, to violate the, uh, the ethical code and the oath that he gives when he receives his, the status. And, there, and therefore, we, we started to defend the political activists since in such political cases, the corrupt, the corrupt, so that in such political cases, the corrupt side of things just can't work. And so it work, So what we get is is uh, pure work, good work. So trying to take the um, attorneys out of the pussy right case, the, the authorities are trying to pressure us, and maybe when we come back to Moscow, they could either Violeta or Mark, they could arrest either Violeta or Mark for, out of some sort of trumped up charge. A separate issue is the media pressure on, on the part of the state since the state TV channels are creating, are creating their own particular image of the people that the authorities don't like. From the very beginning of the Pussy Riot case, in the course of uh, over, the, over six months, on all the leading TV stations in the country, which are all in some way or another under the control of the state, our defendants have been, have been shown in the, most, in the most horrible light. They have been presented as, as blasphemers, in other words, blasphemers, as people who are not worthy of the name human. 
And these people who watch t TV and, um, and are not critical about the information that is given to them, they believe this. Therefore, when we had a, a trial, the authorities in the same way um, were characterizing the attorneys. And now they say that the attorneys are the ones who put them in jail. That the judge and the, the prosecutor wanted to release them, but the attorneys um, put them in jail, which is just absolutely absurd because the attorneys don't have the authority to put people in prison. They can only get people out and free, and free them. So, in order to provide a basis for why there be why the attorneys would put them in prison, they say the authorities say these aren't, aren't attorneys; these are extremely liberal politicians, and, and they are scoring political points in this case. I don't know if, if prison counts as political points, but it's close; it's it's on the horizon. Therefore, it's very important to understand that in Russia. Despite the fact that there is a constitution, there are laws, the majority of these laws are purely declarative. In fact, they just are not implemented and in, in political cases. In other cases, everything is decided for money, in, in, almost all the, in most of the cases. And in this connection, uh, I think that, that it's absolutely correct that here there is an understanding of the fact that this is a political case. This is very important to understand. This is not a criminal case. This is just a, exclusively a criminal case. Thank you. Next um, on, our, we, on our list of questioners is um, my esteemed colleague, Bert Newborn from the law school. Wait, you may not applaud when you've heard the question. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I, um, am deep, I deeply admire the courage and the purpose uh, behind the um, um, provocation that the Pussy Riot um, uh, uh, engaged in. And I urge you all to read the final statements that they made to the court uh, on August 8th. Each of the imprisoned young women made a remarkable final statement to the court, which is available on the internet and which should be read because it um, explains the political um, and social context of their acts um, really quite brilliantly. Um, now, having said that, though, um, my, my question is a narrow one, and it's, it's a legal one. Um, they they um, staged their provocation on the altar of a religious sanctuary um, um, in a way that inevitably had to be offensive to the believers uh, who truly believe in, um, in the, that religious um, doctrine. And my question to you is, um, should, should there be a, um, a law against staging provocations in religious settings that deeply offend the sensibilities of the believers? And is what, is what we really are reacting against here the indefensible barbarity of a two-year sentence uh, for what is a provocation that perhaps could be punished by some minor infraction, but that has been raised to a political level um, in an attempt to deter other people from uh, protesting? I will answer. The thing is that you won't believe, but we have a law like that. And, and my, my colleague Mark Fagan was just speaking about that. This is an administrative law that, that um, gives a, that, that, that has a punishment for offending the believers. And theoretically, when such things happen, they are punished specifically that way, with a fine. 
we don't even have the, the possibility of, of temporary imprisonment, imprisonment for such uh, violations. And therefore, in this situation, in this particular situation, um, the, entire, um, the entire community of lawyers supports us. Th because this administrative law should have been applied. And this is both, this is both um, communities of lawyers. Before, in all the, in, in all the history of, um, of attorneys' actions in, in um, Russia, there's never been a time when, when, attorney, when the attorneys' associations have made public statements like this um, about a ca case that is being um, conducted by other attorneys. This is the first time in history for of, of more than 100 years when attor that attorneys have signed a, a collective letter in which they express their outrage about the actions of the authorities and their solidarity with our group of attorneys, of attorneys about this particular case. We didn't expect such a reaction. We weren't um, prepared. We didn't prepare them. And for us, this was a, a surprise when this, pu when this letter was published. Uh, and I, the second, I had a second uh, brief question. Um, the, I, you can't help but admire the courage of the three lawyers who are defending. Um, and you mentioned that there might be some action taken against you. Um, I wonder if you could be more specific about the risks that the lawyers are running. So, and what, if anything, we in the United States can do uh, to help minimize those risks? Very quickly here. You know, in connection with this case, yes, really, for us, as attorneys, there is a, there is a, a big risk. My colleague Nikolai Polis have already said that we are subject to, um, to being called um, to, to a committee in Russia to, be, to, give, um, to give testimony as witnesses um, for a criminal, the criminal case of May 6th. On the, we, we were indeed at that um, protest and we supported our defendants. We represented, uh, we represented, I'm sorry, we represented the interests of the leaders of the protest, of Russian protests. We are defending Sergei Udaltsov, one of the leaders, Alexei Navalny, another important leader, Nimsov, another one, and others other leaders. So um, we were there because we were there as attorneys um, doing our jobs. We don't have the right to be interrogated by the authorities for this. We don't, we, there are federal laws in Russia. There are inter, there's international law. So the Constitutional Court of, we've gone to the Constitutional Court of Russia for this, but this does not interest the um, investigation. My, my colleague Fagan was interrogated, was questioned about this case, and I was summoned twice um, to an investigator, and twice I refused to come. I made a public statement um, about this. But when I return to Russia, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm, I expect a forced, um, a, a forced summons and maybe a, a search, which will therefore violate the rights of my defendants. Unfortunately, to do something in Russia about this is impossible. You can only battle it after the fact. And I'm just going to add a, 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 a little bit. Uh, at this protest where there was a huge confrontation with the police, I was on, I was on the stage at the, at the culminating point, and I, 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 and I called for, the, for people to sit, to have a sit-in um, protest. My words could be under, understood according to a particular law of the criminal code as a um, call to mass disorder. Uh, 
Да, эта запись размещена в интернете. This, this recording has been put on the internet, and uh, I have been shown it on um, for identification, and they gave, and they, and they asked me why so I summoned people to, um, why I told people to sit. Но поскольку я еще повторяю, Закон не действует, это может быть since как призыв к массовому беспорядку. Since, since really work, this could be considered a um, call to mass disorder. Вот. И такого рода вещи, они And such things постоянно. happen all the time. У меня ситуация здесь. Да, у меня ситуация здесь. I had a, more, a funnier situation. На мне висел бейджик организатор. Висел бейджик организатор. Oh, I had the an organizer, an organizer's badge hanging on my neck. Mm -hmm. And that's it. <laughs> that was enough. Um, the fabulous Miss Barbara Browning from the Department of Performance Studies. Um, thank you. Uh, at a recent panel also here at NYU that was actually organized by Elliot, who's translating, um, it, which was also on the Pussy Riot case, concerns similar to those of uh, Professor Newborn who spoke uh, earlier, were expressed regarding offending religious sensibilities. These were some of the same concerns that were expressed in December of 1989 when members of the AIDS activist group ACT UP staged an action in St. Patrick's Cathedral, many of them lying down on the floor of the church in a massive die-in. About 150 people were arrested. Ed Koch, who was mayor at the time, recently noted, that the, noted the similarities between the ACT UP and the Pussy Riot actions and actually expressed, I'm quoting, delight in Putin's firm response to what he characterized as religious hatred. But at the time of the ACT UP action, many of those arrested presented themselves as deeply invested Catholics for whom their protest constituted a sincere act of faith within the church. In fact, one former seminarian who was arrested said, the strongest prayer I've ever made in my life was on the floor of St. Patrick's Cathedral. So my question is, to what extent would you characterize Pussy Riot's action as a religious, not an anti-religious act? And what would the legal implications of acknowledging that a feminist prayer might be an act of faith? Uh, listen, for, they were, they were there for 40 seconds, they were not on the altar, they were in front of it. This is, this is a, a, a raised a bit. This is, that women, women aren't allowed there, yes they are. <laughs> there's, there, is no, there is no direct, um, there's no direct decree saying that you can't do that, but the tradition is that women are not supposed to be on this particular spot. 40 seconds. They just gave a very quick speech in 40 seconds. And then they got on their knees and they crossed themselves. I don't see anything here that is blasphemous. I don't see anything here that is hurting the feelings of um, the believers. Of the three women who were arrested and two are um, hiding, three of them are, are um, Russian Orthodox believers and um, church members. Надежда Толоконникова is, is more an, of an agnostic, and only Yekaterina Samutsevich, um, though she was um, baptized, is an atheist. And so you understand there was no violent character to this action. And, and the violent character is what's essential for this particular law. They didn't resist. They didn't violate the um, rituals because there was no liturgy at the time. They didn't um, break a single church object. They didn't, um, they didn't offend anyone with their actions. They didn't strip. They didn't offend anyone in front of them. This was a short political action that, that, sh that should have been uh, punished administratively. They should have had to pay a fine. And, and, that, um, and you can see that from the materials of the case. But no one cares. They were just put in prison. Thank you. 
Next, um, another esteemed colleague from the NYU School of Law, Stephen Holmes. Thanks. Um, so I'm a little surprised that you haven't mentioned the nature of the cathedral in which the video was taken. It, 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 could you say a little bit about how the cathedral has a political role in Russian, uh, the, in, the, in the Putin scene, and that it's different from a small church in a, in a village somewhere? Okay, so it's the f first, if I could ask a second question. So the first question was about saying something about what the Kram is and how it, how it functions politically. But you've said, all of you, that uh, this is a political case, not a legal case. But you haven't said much, really, about the politics. So what, can you help us understand, one, what was motivating, what's motivating the Kremlin? Putting Kordakovsky in jail makes sense. You can steal his company. But as far as I know, there was nothing here to steal, actually, in this case. They are not very powerful actors. So what did they, what were they trying to do? Who were they trying to intimidate? Uh, uh, is there a huge punk opposition that they're going to chill? No, that doesn't seem to make sense. Are they trying to mobilize uh, traditionalist support against the Moscow crowds? Is that what's going on? So if you could tell us what the purpose was and then have they succeeded or not in doing these things? First, as far uh, about the um, the Church of Christ the Savior, the Church of Christ the Savior was blown up in the 30s by the communists. Then there was a large swimming pool, <laughs> an, an open swimming, open air swimming pool. And after the Soviet Union fell apart, um, they decided to restore the cathedral. Um, they, they filled in the swimming pool and they built up the cathedral, but it became a different cathedral. Besides the actual construction, there was a, there's a, a whole complex there. There's a hall of, um, of church. Uh, there's a hall of church uh, cathedrals. There's some cafes and there's a car wash and, and offices. And offices. And offices for some of our co Pretty colleagues who are lawyers. <laughs> Since uh, most of. Uh, now the 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 um, and since you're all uh, since you're attorneys here, you understand that the um, ownership of this cathedral belongs to the government of Moscow, not to uh, the church. The church takes only a small part, basically rents a small part. Uh, everything else is um, not a religious spot. So, but, so they say the, the, the punk prayer in the Church of Christ Cathedral is bad. But, na, but really, in this, in this little um, area, this church area that's just 10 meters from the altar, in May, the, the Bonnie M group, which is a... Um, the, uh, uh, sang and danced there, and no one had any questions or complaints about this pop group singing there. And there were icons there. Therefore, as far as the sacred role of this, this cathedral goes, um, this is absolutely um, something new. <laughs> that has no spirituality in it whatsoever. There's only business. And one other thing. The church on the ter territory of this cathedral um, sells, ca sells candles, gold crosses. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of precious metals going through there and, and souvenirs. So the, the, um, the Hamovnichi court that, um, that convicted Pussy Riot at first, in the beginning of the summer, decided that everything that gets sold in this uh, cathedral of Christ the Savior is not, it's not about um, buying and selling. These, uh, um, instead, you're, you're um, giving donations um, rather than buying and selling. And, and this is just a fake um, deal. But but um, thanks to the um, power of the patriarchate, the uh, court felt that this is just perfectly normal. 
that the, this fake deal. Oh, um, now, why this particular place was chosen for the action of Pussy Riot? The thing is that the church, but church is separate from the state according to law. Uh, but three days before the event, the patriarch announced to all believers, and the, the, the patriarch for, for all, all the um, believers is, is they're holy, and, he, and what he commands is, is um, obligatory to all believers. But the patriarch said that, believer, that Orthodox believers should not go to protests. He forbade them to go to mass protests. And he also, he also basically called on them to vote for Putin. He said, I believe in Putin. <laughs> the young women in their song saying, uh, the patriarch Kirill believes in Putin. He should believe in God, but he believes in Putin. So basically, from, because of all this, um, they chose this particular cathedral. And Patriarch Kirill um, is um, in charge of this cathedral. Therefore, they chose this one. They came to this one. And to continue, our assistant, Alisa, shall tell a little bit about, um, about who this message was for. Um, first of all, based on what my colleagues have said, we should, you should understand that the uh, participants of Pussy Riot were uh, bringing um, Russia's, um, Russia's and the whole world's attention to the problem of this, this um, concord between the church and the state. Before it, the, the be, before this um, action, before this performance, you could say with complete certainty that few people in in Russia were thinking thinking about this problem of church and state. Therefore, the women were addressing the entire country, and first of all, the um, the young people. Who, who had, um, who in December had taken part in these um, mass protests, December of last year. They were addressing also the older generations, and and you can say, and we can say with complete certainty that they achieved their goal because. Now, the most tense discussion in Russia is the discussion about the existence of God and the extent of his, his um, influence on people's minds. And this question, and people are answering this question not in the church. They're arguing about this on the street. So this is the case when the question of the existence of God has become a political question. Okay. Um, next on my list is the great Jason Schultz, from, also from NYU School of Law. Thanks. So I study um, online media and social media and the use of the internet um, and how it impacts freedom of expression. And um, I find the Pussy Riot situation very interesting because um, some people will put things online anonymously um, or they'll only be online, but this was a physical, Im uh, an act in a particular place, which then also was online. And um, while it seems that because in Russia, uh, much of the media is state-owned, that the internet has enabled this uh, video and much of the message to get out to a broader audience and perhaps even to keep it from being taken offline by Putin or some of the government. I wonder if also, as you suggested um, with your experience, that also filming people and putting it online could potentially be used against activists too. And so there might be some tension between reaching an audience, but also um, the online media being used against activists. And I'm just wondering 
um, how you all feel about this uh, in terms of the use of online media, how has it helped and um, how has it hurt it at all in the political movement that you're part of? The thing is that here you can't choose. The internet is this um, free, is this free um, medium that is, that is not being controlled or censored by the government and serves as a way of spreading information, free information. If there were another way, if there were free mass media, free traditional mass media, then, then the Russian opposition would have would use them uh, widely, would use the mass media widely. You properly said that the internet is also dangerous for political activists because um, the, the clip of, um, of the punk prayer appeared on the same day uh, um, on the internet. So our, our argument with the um, investigation was that that if they wanted to, uh, if, they, if they wanted to get them for the composition of this punk prayer, then it then the problem then it appeared in the internet. Um, but not in the church because it wasn't heard in the church. The composition um, in the clip lasts for more than three minutes. But um, but in the church they only were able to, to perform for 40, 40 seconds. So there is a different law about extremism that. Um, that also was used um, for examination of the materials um, by the investigation. And so it's possible that there could be a second case for the clip, for the video, because they have been sentenced for what happened in the church. And they are, sent, they are sentenced for what happened in the church. The argument about what the what the crime actually is. Was there um, a motivation of religious hatred? Which, um, as, uh, according to the subjective side of the crime, is the is essential, an essential characteristic of this particular law, um, according to which they were um, sentenced. So the, the video. The video is not part of the examination of the um, criminal case. But only from this video can you um, figure out, only from, from the video could you possibly get this motif of religious hatred. But the problem for the investigation is that this, this law has only, is only of medium um, seriousness. And if, the criminal, if a criminal case were, were um, brought up for this particular law, they, could, they couldn't have been um, held in preventive detention. But they were imprisoned because they were used a criminal um, a criminal. Uh, Okay. They, they used a criminal law that makes it more serious, that allows for the possibility of up to seven years imprisonment. And therefore, in this way, we think this is also an expression of the political motivation of the authorities in order, who wanted to just... Um, to deal with the, the pussy riot group. Того, and this is not the first, this is by no means the first action, um, public этого, action of pussy riot. A few weeks before that, площади. they did an action on, um, on Red Square. Putin um, with with um, the um, composition that, um, put, that Putin pissed himself. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they got a fine for that. So, ruling, to rule out that the authorities will continue to um, persecute, to to persecute the, other, um, the other participants and the defendants, well, this can't be ruled out. They could still go after them. So, um, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Peter Verslov, uh, Nadia's husband from, from Pussy Riot. 
And also Suzanne Nossel, the Executive Director of Amnesty International. We're very happy to have you both with us here today. And I'm going to give you guys the last word before I then open this up to the audience. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a big pleasure to be here in New York. Um, I, was, um, I went to the prison to see Nadia on Monday, and well, once again, we were discussing, well, I told her that we're gonna go to the United States and meet all these people and meet Yoko Ono and everyone else. And, um, and she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting in Moscow pretrial detention center number six, and you get to go meet Yoko Ono, all right. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> Right, and so once again, we were discussing how uh, it is incredible that well, people all over the world have really been able to take up the girls' cause and truly really understand their values and basically stand up in their support. Uh, there was this beautiful article in the New York Times which ended with uh, the reporter talking to this 12-year-old girl from Queens, I think, and uh, well, the girl was like, well, yeah, and I think it's really cool to be a riot girl nowadays because these Russian, this Russian group really showed the way. But of course, of course, this was a 90s thing, said this 12-year-old girl, and the reporter's like, really, a 90s thing? He's like, yes, so it was a thing back in the 90s, but it's really cool again because of this R Russian punk band which got arrested. So and I'm, I'm just saying this to point out that it really is incredible that, uh, well, Americans and American teenagers were able to read the values uh, which were cultivated and put forward by the woman of Pussy Riot. And well, that basically means that their cause and the months they're spending in prison, that's all that is not worthless. And well, their fight is living on and then everything they stand up for will prevail. Thank you, everyone. and it's great to see all of you here today. Uh, as Amnesty International, we declared Pussy Riot prisoners of conscience right after they uh, were arrested and detained. And we have been mobilizing our activists in countries all over the world in every region on behalf of this case. And it's a case that's really galvanized, I think, particularly the next generation of the human rights movement. And you know, part of it is that uh, you know, Peter's 26. I mean, he's, the, he's your age, uh, basically, most of you around this room. And he and, and Nadja and this group have taken tremendous personal risk and sacrifice to stand up for the values of freedom of expression and, and freedom of assembly and to challenge their government uh, and to really catalyze the world to take a stand on their behalf. And uh, we were just uh, talking to a journalist who's covered Russia for many years uh, and who was, you know, bring, brought out an old poster to, to, to remember that it's been, uh, you know, more than 20 years, I think, since people have really looked hard at, at the human rights situation in Russia, uh, and that Americans in particular and, and, and people throughout the Western world have focused on what is a really disturbing climate of a shrinking space for civil society and for human rights defenders, and that space just got smaller this week. Uh, and there will be Russian groups, it's not just USAID programs that will be affected, but there'll be Russian groups that are affected deeply by what's happening. And I think that, that we want to just uh, tribute Pussy Riot for their courage uh, and the stand that you've taken and to say that as Amnesty, on behalf of our three million members around the world, we're going to stand with you until Nadja and Masha and Katya are free and, and they can express themselves freely. And we really j ask all of you to join in this, uh, this fight. You can look at our website at amnestyusa.org slash Pussy Riot and take action and stand with us uh, and, and stand with these very brave women. So thrilled to be here and, and uh, thank you for your concern about this case. I asked 
Um, now I'm opening it up to you guys for questions for this panel. And there is a mic set up if you want to um, go over there um, to use it. And if you could identify yourself. I am Amy Shoulder. <laughs> um, I'm the editorial director of the Feminist Press, and I handed around these cards. Um, we're publishing um, a collection of the writings, the letters uh, from prison, the closing statements by Pussy Riot, and I wanted to thank you, um, the defense attorneys. We translated your, um, your closing statements for the book, and uh, it articulates the message um, so importantly, and we've rushed it out. It's, uh, it's an e-book. And it really gives, I think, it, it, it gives us an opportunity for 100 pages to see really the, the meaning and value of, of the, the which, what has been such a powerful message. But um, in this process for, of putting this book together, I was working with Elisa Abarzoa on the permission to publish and the copyright issues. And I was wondering, um, and, and want to thank you, Lisa, publicly for um, facilitating this whole process, and wondered if there was discussion on how to, uh, I mean, we had a contract, it's a, it's a book contract, so there were, you know, we needed to have in writing permission to, to use the text, and I wondered if you could talk about if there were discussions about intellectual property and copyright, if there were other um, publishers. I know online there have been, there's been great presence, so I wonder if you could talk about that. The, okay. uh, First of all, cop copyright is important in, in order not to permit, not to permit the misuse of these materials. In Russia, this is a, a very important problem because there's a huge pressure on our defendants and they are accused of of uh, being blasphemers and that they're, they are starring in porn films. And so there's an amazing stories, incredible stories about them. And therefore we were forced to defend our defendants, um, to, to, defend, to defend their copyright and their trademark. And recently I learned that in Germany some, some person gave, uh, 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 put in documents to try to get, um, to, to sell alcohol called Pussy Riot. This is just unbelievable because there, there are no condoms of Pussy Riot, there's no, there can't be any condoms of Pussy Riot or alcohol of Pussy Riot. There's Pussy Riot's music, there's Pussy Riot's political position, that's free, but everything else is just um, commercial, and we're trying to, to stop that. We're trying. Um, in, we have about 15 minutes left and many people wanting to ask questions and I'm going to suggest a couple of things to the questioners and one is to try to keep your questions as short as, as you can and two I was thinking of collecting questions so have a couple of questions at a time and then have the panel respond as they wish and perhaps what we'll do is start with um, I'm, I'm recognizing Amelia Dunbar um, from Occupy and, and Gideon Oliver from and maybe you guys can ask your questions at one, you know, one at a time, and then give the panel a moment. Hi. Um, so with Occupy, I've been arrested and charged with wearing a mask before, and the NYPD here enforces a law from 1845, which prevents three or more people wearing masks from gathering in public, um, unless they're going to or coming from a masquerade. Um, so, I think the special masquerade conditions of this enforcement just goes to show that the state only really cares about protecting those who are rich and privileged enough 
to even care about masquerades. Uh, so I only speak for myself, but I don't think that this law should ever prevent anyone from trying to preserve their anonymity and essentially their safety and courage uh, in the struggle against the state and against individualism. So my question, can you please elaborate on uh, the empowering and unifying effects of mask wearing in fighting state suppression? Uh, and I had a, I had a quick, I had a quick comment and a quick question. I'll compress both. Uh, as for the comment, uh, I can just into some up twinkles uh, to you, which are positive for those uh, sort of in occupy terms. And uh, the question uh, that I have is: um, Pussy Riot has become visible, visible in the midst of uh, over a year of protests all across the globe. Uh, in many countries, including the U.S., we've seen extremely aggressive and often unlawful police and government responses to these protests. Uh, how do you see the Pussy Riot protests and the Russian government's responses fitting into this larger context? So, about the mask law, if in the United States it was, this, this law was made 150 years ago, in Russia they made that law in, in the spring. <laughs> so this is, this, is, this is the difference in our accomplishments in law. <laughs> in Russia, the, the democracy is very young. It's just a newborn baby. And so we have something to learn. But you have to observe a balance between uh, civil rights and the interests of society. Of course, it's hard to uh, decide exactly what the difference is between criminals and masks and people put on masks for other reasons, um, not, in, not involved in, in crime. And here, it's important that in a democratic society where, where there are opposing forces in the courts, um, that, that the two sides can, um, can determine um, where this boundary lies. In my opinion, it's, it's particularly in court that the court in courts that these things that are not completely regulated by the law are determined um, according to concrete cases. And here it's very important to keep in mind particularly the, uh, the way in what the legal process and the way um, in which this works with the, the laws. Uh, just a couple words about the Pussy Riot as part of the global protest. Here, uh, both, well, of course, Pussy Riot can be understood as a kind of leftist project, anti-globalist, for instance, but this isn't the most important part, not at all. This, this is, first of all, an open civil um, conflict with a, an authoritarian regime. And so the, the um, danger is real. The Occupy movement in America, despite all the problems that, that, are, that they run into, these still are protests that are taking place in the conditions of a democracy. Of, um, you know, it's a matter of taste. Everybody can figure out, you know, decide for themselves. But in Russia, there is simply no democracy. And the price of such, the cost of such a, of a protest is much higher. The women, the, um, here, you know, the women are, are, are uh, are, 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 held with, are found with masks and then let go. And here um, in Russia, you could get 15 days in um, detention while they figure things out. So that, that's in the best, best scenario. So that's a very big difference. Uh, 
Hi, thank you. Uh, my name's Patrick Deere. I'm an associate professor in the English department. Um, and uh, I just wanted to thank uh, our panelists and visitors for Russia for um, uh, reminding us of the political and legal dimension to your struggle, uh, which has been extremely inspiring to many people here. Uh, I had two uh, fairly straightforward questions. One, from the point of view of someone who's interested in uh, culture, to what degree is um, punk, in other words, oppositional musical culture involved uh, in the political process by the band? It's, after all, called a punk prayer. Uh, and my second question is, um, when you watch the original video rather than the, the three-minute video, it's initially hard to understand what's going on. You've referred to those amazing 40 seconds in front of the altar. To start off with, you, you um, referred to it as a speech, and then um, you made the point that it was just a 40 seconds of performance. And in that respect, it really was not didn't involve acts of blasphemy. Um, here, it, it was described as lip syncing. Uh, what was it from uh, the band's point of view? Was it all three things, speech, performance, lip syncing, music? Does the law make a distinction? Does it matter? Yeah, well, um, my, my question is about um, po political uses of artists. And um, I understand this is a political trial. And uh, it's a political trial for Putin. And I wonder to what extent, for the opposition, uh, Pussy Riot has become a very good thing. And they're used by the opposition to the Putin administration now uh, very successfully in terms of the international support and visibility this case has gained. And uh, 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 in connection to that, I want to ask you about the Pussy Riot lists that apparently you have suggested, and I read in Izvestia, that um, uh, you had uh, been negotiating in Washington a Pussy Riot list, uh, which would be a list of functionaries connected to the case and possibly journalists that have prejudicially reported on the case that would be excluded from coming to the United States. Which, from our, you know, free speech point of view, would not be a good thing. <laughs> okay, but about the first question. In Russia, the opposition is uh, represents a wide specter of people. Uh, of course, first of all, educated people who live in um, big cities and who are critical um, about the information that they get through um, the state media. These people uh, listen to all sorts of music, but punk, in my opinion, is the most, re is the most real uh, answer to this pressure from the state on the, um, on the opposition as an extreme form of nihilism that is get presented in musical form. If you remember this, the sources of punk, then punks were protesting against the system. And here in this case, I, I think that's the most uh, appropriate music to be used for protest. But I uh, repeat that there's a whole range of, of oppositional musical groups that play rock and rap and all sorts of things. But the punk is the, is the brightest, um, the, the most noticeable form. Uh, it was, uh, what was the nature of the act in front of the altar? Was it speech, performance, music, lip syncing? Does the law make a distinction about that? They wanted to, to perform their, their composition right there that, that you saw in the video. That, that was their idea, to perform this composition. That, but, the, but there was just idiotic choreography, in my opinion. <laughs> But it's a question of taste. 
But the most important thing is there was nothing, there was no blasphemy. At the same time, in one of the cities in Russia, um, on, uh, with this same law, someone um, under the same law, someone broke into a law, uh, broke a cross, uh, went, to the, went to the altar and um, knocked down part of the altar, uh, um, hit, uh, hit the icons, and you see, they didn't really, they didn't sentence him. They didn't even arrest him. The, if you, the existence, if you think of, the, of what makes, what constitutes a crime here, there, 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 this has, there has to be violence here. This is the most important part. This, and this is the, the, this most, the most important distinction between, um, between different types of crimes here. Our, they, our juridical arguments were not accepted. And this crime, this, their action was um, evaluated in terms of its potential. They wanted to do this. They wanted to perform this. And so, in a sense, that what was criminal was their intent. Some of the words, of, some of the words in this composition are offensive to the uh, patriarch uh, personally, but there was there's nothing in the cr there's nothing here to make a, the crime of, um, a, of offending someone. There's no we have we have written law, we have the codexes, we have sanctions. Uh, we don't have a system of where, the, where the court decides what is criminal and what is not. There's no crime here of, of blasphemy. Therefore, they were uh, sentenced um, for political reasons. Well, <laughs> in the um, the the investigator on the Pussy Riot case, he described the choreography as, a quote, they were hitting an invisible enemy with their fists. So this is basically the language which was put in the uh, official accusation. Well, I don't know. I think the choreo chore choreography is quite interesting for, uh, well, kind of a rebirth of Riot Girl, which is essentially happening in the case of Pussy Riot. If you look at what was happening on stages in early 90s in the United States when all these Riot Girl bands were on stage, I think that choreography was much more brutal than, than what the Pussy Riot Girls were doing in the church. Uh, obviously, they were doing that in uh, clubs around the United States. Here we have a Russian church, but, uh, well, Russia is a much more brutal and uh, hard to understand country. <laughs> About the list, the Pussy Riot list, I say immediately that, that Izvestia, the newspaper you read this in, is a very politically engaged um, newspaper. Now it's an, a, basically an official Kremlin paper. You just have to divide everything that they put in there into four parts, just divide it into quarters. But about the list, the truth is that in the US there is um, a bill uh, the Magnitsky Act uh, that, um, uh, that provides uh, for uh, uh, limitations uh, on people on the entry um, to the states by people who had something to do with the Magnitsky case. <laughs> and there is a footnote saying um, that also covers other people who violate human rights. And in, in the case of Pussy Riot, it's the, the um, violation of human rights is obvious. You don't even have to be an attorney to get that. So, of course, this is a, a way of, of putting on political pressure on the authorities who which are acting not according to the law. I feel that all the people who are in some way or another involved in violating human rights should be judged by the world community and included in this list, including people who are involved in the um, imprisonment of pussy riot. Absolutely. Um, I'm sorry to have to do this, but we're out of time. I want to Thank um, the lawyers, and I actually would like to ask Peter to say their names because I realize 
that um, I was waiting for him to pronounce them so that I didn't embarrass myself with my inadequate Russian. So would you please say the names of all of our, our panelists for today? And thank you, Peter, as well. Okay, then let's once again uh, give a big applause for Violeta Volkova. <laughs> for Mark Fagan. <laughs> for uh, Nikolai Polozov. <laughs> and for Alisa Obrasova. Bornstein for remarkable translation under pressure. Thank you to you all. <laughs> and, um, I invite you all um, to come, those of you who didn't get your chance to ask questions, to come up and speak to, to speak to our guests. Thank you for coming to NYU.